I'm very, very excited um, about this day and about the chance of getting to meet all of you. And I think it's just wonderful you know, for all of us um, to get together and get to know each other and learn from one another. Um, so welcome to the very first Schaff yang Syndrome family meeting. And I couldn't start, Hannah, before you arrive because I'm starting this off with a quote, you know, <laughs> You said this, and I, I feel this is, you know, kind of the theme uh, of today and of the journey that many of you have been on. F some of you have been on this journey for many years, but now you are not longer alone. You have a tribe. So welcome to your tribe, okay? And um, as we get together, we also realize that, you know, as individuals, we can only achieve so much, right? As a physician, I can only achieve so much, but um, together, you know, we can achieve much more. And um, we're all in this as a team, and um, we will be on this journey for many years, um, trying to understand the condition better and also um, moving, you know, towards uh, therapeutic considerations, medications. Um, it's going to be a long journey, um, but we don't give up easily. And as long as we can stand together, I think we can achieve much. Um, as part of the team, I would like to welcome um, Ryan Potts and Rachel Verrick. Um, so I think uh, all of us are in a lucky situation today because when you think about the major 2 gene and uh, Schaaf-Yang syndrome, the three people who know the most about this gene are probably in this room right now. Rachel has worked on Majel 2 for um, 15 uh, years. Um, she, um, uh, you know, understands much more about um, the cellular functions and, uh, and about the general kind of chromosome locus that relates to Majel 2 than most of us. She has participated in some groundbreaking research studies that relate to the generating mouse models of MAGEL2 and understanding what happens when you take it out of an organism or a cell. And then we have Ryan Potts here, um, who used to be at UT Southwestern and is now at St. Jude's in Memphis. And um, when it comes to the molecular functions um, of MAGEL2, what it does, what it, like, you know, how it interacts with others and how all of that affects the, the mechanisms that need to be going on in a cell, um, Ryan is really the hero. Um, so I hope we can all learn you know, a lot from one another today, and both Ryan and Rachel will be giving talks as well. So you know, I was asked this question by some of you uh, last night. Um, how did it all begin? So I wanted to share a little bit of this story with you so that you can understand how I got into the field, because I never meant to be a schaff yang syndrome researcher. Um, it all began with Donny. Um, Donny is our patient number one. Um, he uh, came from Arizona to see me in 2012 um, as a 13-year-old boy at that time um, with a diagnosis of autism. But, you know, very quickly as I was talking to his parents, um, it became clear that there was more to it. You know, it was not just a history of autism. But one of the first questions that his mom asked me was, you know, she said, Dr. Schaff, I'm still wondering, does he have Prader-Willi syndrome? Because when he was born, all the physicians felt that he looked like a kid with Prader-Willi syndrome. And they told me that that, you know, would likely be the diagnosis. But then they sent off the test and it came back negative. And I'm still confused. Does he have it or doesn't he have it? Um, so I got more history. And so it was clear that he was born with very low muscle tone. He had feeding difficulties. He had an undescended testicle. And this combination of features makes, you know, many physicians think of Prader-Willi syndrome. So they send off the test within the first two weeks. They came back negative. He then went on to have developmental delay, um, fairly obsessive compulsive behaviors, um, and mild intellectual disability, needs some special help in school, and has a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. And at that time, we did uh, genetic testing on him and his parents, and he was found to have a mutation in the MAGEL2 gene. This was a mutation that was not present in either of his parents, what we call a de novo mutation. And um, with that, he was patient number one. Now, we've come a long way since 2013, 
um, because as of today, uh, I am aware of more than 100 individuals worldwide uh, who have these kind of mutations in the MAGEL2 gene and who have the clinical presentation of sharp yang syndrome. And um, this has been tremendously important to our research because, you know, from each one of these children and uh, some adults, I have learned a lot about the condition and I think, you know, we understand so much better today um, what this entails and also what the trajectory is over time and the clinical course over time than we did when we first reported it in 2013. So I have two topics that are listed uh, on the schedule. Um, the first one uh, to talk about the clinical features of scharf yang syndrome, and then um, I'll talk about the genetics of scharf yang syndrome um, for you all to be better able to understand because it's fairly complex when it comes to the genetics of this. So I'll try to make it, you know, um, understandable. But this is not supposed to be very formal, so whenever you have any questions, you can ask, you know, um, the most important part about this is that you take, you know, home what you need and that you get to ask the questions that you need to ask, right? And um, also beyond this session, um, at, I mean, I think I can speak for all three of us, you know, we are around and you can approach us and ask any questions or you can send us emails, you know, after, after the conference. <laughs> so let's talk um, about the clinical features. Um, it all starts with pregnancy and uh, looking back, um, a lot of the moms report, especially those who have had multiple pregnancies, they report that um, there was something different about this pregnancy and one of the things that I hear frequently is that the baby didn't move as much, wasn't as vigorous, didn't kick as much. And then several of the moms have had problems with what's called polyhydramnios which means an accumulation of fluid, um, that there's more fluid around the baby than in other pregnancies. And then the baby is born, and uh, for most of the kids, um, the physicians have noticed shortly after birth um, that something is different and that the kids need um, a little more medical attention than your average child uh, right after birth. So the common features that we see are low muscle tone, and then, you know, as they go on and supposed to start feeding and latching on, um, a lot of the kids struggle um, with feeding and they have difficulty breastfeeding, but, you know, oftentimes also difficulty bottle feeding. So they may need, you know, they may need much longer or they may, may need special nipples and some of the kids need tube feeding. Um, many of the boys have undescended testicles um, that can also be noticed, you know, shortly after birth or, um, you know, even if you don't, um, notice the testicles themselves, the scrotum um, is kind of smaller, tends to be smaller uh, than in most boys. And so with that combination of features, um, you know, I think most of the kids who I've heard their medical stories um, have actually gotten Prader-Willi syndrome testing within the first few weeks of life and then it comes back negative. And I'll tell you later as we go into the genetics why that test comes negative. As the kids get older, a developmental delay is a common feature. Um, so the kids uh, tend to reach their developmental milestones at a later age than what would be expected. And we have studied, um, uh, I want to say like 35, so these data are based on the first 35 or so patients um, that we've been in touch with. And these are the average time points, you know, where they met these milestones. So on average, they're able to sit at 19 months, which you know, you're supposed to be sitting at six to eight months. They walk at 39 months, um, which on average, you know, we're supposed to walk at like 12 to 14 months, and then first words at 56 months. What's very important here is that you see there are big ranges, right? So some, some kids sat at eight months. That's, you know, quite normal. But some of them didn't sit until they were three years old. Um, so there's a range and, you know, at the time of birth, it's hard to predict for your particular child, you know, when will she be able to sit, when will she be able to walk. Um, you know, I can only say, you know, on average, this is what we're looking at. Another really important message here is that all of the kids that I know, they continue to progress, you know, they continue to get better over time and they may need a lot of therapies and help 
but they get better. It's not one of the conditions where kids develop to a certain point and then <coughs> they, you know, stop doing, you know, um, their developmental progressions or where they regress and they get worse. They, these kids typically do not lose any developmental milestones, which is, you know, very important, I think, for the families to understand. Now, we're in touch with some families um, where even at an older age, um, the, the kids don't walk or don't speak. Um, but those are few. I would say the vast majority of children that we have in our database have reached every single one of these three milestones over the years. It just takes them longer. <laughs> When it comes to cognition and behavior, <coughs> developmental delay is present in almost all of the kids. Okay. Intellectual disability, which is a term that we use after um, the fifth birthday and is based on you know, a measurement of IQ and their functioning level, um, is present in more than 90% of children. But that also means that there are some children um, who do not have intellectual disability. So that means there are some children who have IQs that are higher than 70. And they may need, still need some extra help in school, but they often do not require special education. So they may need you know, some like classroom modifications and some tutoring, but they may not need special education. There's some, some of those kids are in the community. And then we noticed very early on that autism spectrum disorder is a, a very common condition. And you know some families get confused because they consider autism spectrum disorder a distinct diagnosis and they wonder, does my kid have autism or does she have Schaaf-Yang syndrome? Um, you know, from our perspective, we would say the autism is part of Schaaf-Yang syndrome. It's just one of the ways that it manifests. You know, just like they have low muscle tone and they have feeding difficulties, and they also have autism spectrum disorder. But again, not all of the kids have that diagnosis. And then this slide, I think, is also important um, for all of you to understand, and this has not been published yet. Um, uh, this looks at IQ testing. So we had um, 10 uh, children come to Texas Children's Hospital last year. Um, for a very in-depth assessment of their cogn uh, cognitive function and their um, autism-related features. Um, and uh, we also did some endocrine studies and some x-ray studies. And, um, and we saw that there's a wide range of how these kids perform in cognitive tests, in IQ tests. So all of these were kids between the age of 5 and 18 years old. You have a question? Oh, okay, yeah, so they were between five and 18 years old because before <coughs> the age of five, it's really difficult to do IQ testing. And so you see that some kids, so one kid here has an IQ of higher than 80. Um, and you know that gets back to the question of intellectual disability. So intellectual disability is defined in part by an IQ that's lower than 70. So we have kids with an IQ as high as 80 something but then we also have kids with an IQ as low as one, three, you know, or kind of similar. So that means there's a wide range. We would call this um, borderline intellectual functioning. Then we have several kids with moderate intellectual disability, but then we also have a few kids which we would consider profound <coughs> intellectual disability. And at this point, I don't know, you know, what the, what the differences are from a genetic perspective, or you know, you wonder why do some kids have an IQ of five and others have an IQ of 80? And you know, with that, can you predict, especially if you have a 12-month-old, you know, as a parent, I would ask, well, Dr. Schaff, tell me, you know, like for this particular mutation, does that mean that we'll face an IQ of 80 or an IQ of five? And I, I can't predict that at this point. I don't understand that part yet, and I hope that uh, one day we'll understand. Mm -hmm. So that's a very good question. The question was if some of these kids have other syndromes on top of Schaaf-Yang syndrome. We actually know this is you know, a general geneticist perspective that when we do these kind of whole genome tests on children with disabilities, we know that about 5% of them have two diagnoses. So we call that dual diagnosis. However, 
for these kids and also the other kids with Sharp Yang syndrome, I have not yet encountered a family or a child that has two diagnoses, which also means that for these two kids who have very low IQs, I'm not aware of a second diagnosis. Okay. Yeah. So this is um, the question of whether the specific mutation relates to the IQ. I'm not aware of that, and um, you know we will need to do more research to see if there are particular mutations that go along with a very low IQ. There's one mutation in MAGEL2 that we know that causes a very severe phenotype, but we wouldn't even see that uh, in these studies because there's one mutation um, for which all of the individuals that we've seen and that have been reported, um, they have a phenotype where even, you know, during the pregnancy, no. it's so severe, they don't move at all, and it leads to um, death even yeah. before birth or shortly after birth. Um, that's one particular mutation. Um, for the other mutations, I have not seen that, you know, there are specific ones that would go along with a more or less severe phenotype. Um, and then there was a second part to your question. Sorry, early intervention. Oh, early intervention, yeah. So I think, you know, that is very important. Um, it's a very important point because, you know, we're not just genetically determined, right? Every one of us is born with a certain window of opportunity of how well, you know, we can do certain things and, you know, kind of the basic setup, you know, to perform in life. And I think for a child with sharp yang syndrome, you know, that, that range of how, you know, we will, how likely we'll reach certain milestones and how well we'll do is different, you know, is shifted from your average child. You know, these kids obviously struggle more and they need to work harder to achieve certain things. Um, but it's still a window of opportunity. It's not just a line, it's a range. And that's where we come in as physicians and parents and therapists because within that range, it's our job to help them develop to the best of their abilities and opportunities. So one thing that's not factored into the IQ testing, though, is the fact that, for instance, with my bipolar medical crises of intellectual reason problems and uh, things that have happened with various doctors and how to brain. Yeah, so I'll just repeat it for the video because we're recording this um, so that the families who look at it later can also hear it. Mrs. Mitchell was making a point that there can be lifetime events and medical complications that may, you know, kind of shift that window of opportunity, especially if there's a very complicated uh, course in the NICU or in the ICU with... Um, um, medical complications that lead to deprivation of oxygen, where less oxygen gets to the brain, that may cause additional hits to the brain, and then will further kind of, you know, shift your window of opportunity to the lower functioning range. Um, that is certainly correct. So um, here are some of the uh, faces uh, of our kids and also the hands, and I've heard this from, you know, several of you that the hands are quite distinct. And I actually felt that um, even in those first four patients that we reported in 2013, that there was something special about the hands. So a lot of the kids are born with contractures where they cannot fully extend their fingers. And then they also tend to have these tapering fingers that taper off to the end. And sometimes they bend in kind of funny ways. So some of the families have said, oh, like the first time they got on the Facebook page, they've said, oh my goodness, like these are the hands of, you know, Johnny, um, and they're not, they, the kids of, they're the hands of some other kids. And then the facial features, um, I do think there's some commonalities. I mean, you've seen uh, some of the families coming together and you see the kids side by side and they look like siblings almost. So I think a lot of the kids, uh, when they're born, um, they have this frontal bossing uh, which is fairly common, and the kind of small and sunken-in nose. 
Um, and then as they get older, I feel that um, a lot of kids kind of have fairly prominent and bushy eyebrows, um, which is a feature that I see in a lot of kids. Um, but then also there's a lot of variability, obviously, um, between these. So as a physician, I would not feel comfortable just based on seeing a child to say, oh, this child has this diagnosis. There's some conditions like this, like Down syndrome, um, but at this point, I don't think the features are so distinct that it would be a diagnosis on first sight. And then there are additional common features of Shafiang syndrome that we've seen. Um, those include sleep apnea, uh, which can be either obstructive, which means that the musculature kind of falls back into the throat while we sleep. And, you know, that's true for everyone to some degree. You know, uh, most people, when they lie on their back, they tend to sl snore more than when they lie on their side. And that's just because kind of the tongue falls into the back of the throat. Um, but because the kids don't have as much muscle tone, that also applies to the muscle in the mouth. And so they tend to have more of this obstruction. But then also centrally, you know, the sleep apnea can be caused um, due to the alterations of functioning and kind of drive of breathing um, that come from the brain. So a lot of kids actually have combined sleep apnea. It's obstructive and central. Eye abnormalities are common, um, particularly strabismus, which also may just relate to muscle weakness. Um, reflux is a common feature. A lot of kids have reflux and um, they have been on medications, you know, to help with that. Several of the kids have required surgery for that um, with what's called a Nissen fundoplicatio, where the juncture between the esophagus and the stomach is kind of made more tight. Um, and a lot of kids have difficulty with temperature regulation such that they tend to overheat easily or, you know, they just not able to handle temperatures as well as others. The endocrine system is affected in, uh, in our kids, um, and a lot of that comes from the hypothalamus, which is kind of the master regulator of the <laughs> endocrine system. Um, so we have seen in many of the kids, and we studied that as part of our investigation last year, we've seen that a lot of kids have growth hormone deficiency. Um, they tend to have more difficulty handling glucose, so with a glucose tolerance test, they're not able to regulate as, uh, as well. Some kids, even in their teenage years, have a diagnosis of diabetes. And then there are also abnormalities in the hormones that are related to food intake and satiety, the feeling of like being full, um, and that I think will certainly need to be the subject of further investigations. Um, scoliosis is seen in many of the children. Uh, sometimes it's really mild um, with only like 15 uh, degrees curvature and not requiring any intervention. But some kids, you know, have scoliosis much more severe. I've seen 50, 60, 70 percent. Um, and uh, that is, you know, a point where you would have to discuss, you know, bracing or even surgical intervention. Um, there's an orthopedic surgeon here at the meeting today, Harold von Bassi, um, who's giving a breakout session later. And he's not only very competent, but also very nice, and I'm sure he'd be willing to answer any questions that you have. Yeah. Then, Kim? Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, Rachel made a comment on this yesterday. You know, some of the Prader Willi kids even, you know, are born with fairly severe scoliosis. Um, generally, it seems that the trend is that this is something that needs to be watched because it tends to progress <coughs> over time. Um, so, um, you know, if it's just 15 degrees right now, um, you know, it may be 25 or 30 in two years from now. So this is certainly something to keep an eye on. Hannah has a comment.
Yeah, so I think what, you know, again, for the audience who will be listening to this later, I think the summary, you know, of Hannah's message is that these are not always easy decisions as to what is the right treatment. Um, so it is also something where you, you know, where it's worth really being in touch with a specialist, you know, so a pediatric orthopedic surgeon, um, ideally who, you know, takes care of children with neurodevelopmental disorders, um, because, you know, this is not just your average case of scoliosis, right? Um, we've also seen, oh, there's one more question. Sure. Okay, so another child who was born with fairly severe scoliosis and had to wear a brace for, for multiple years. So as part of the study last year, uh, we also saw that bone mineral density um, is a real issue um, as it tends to be low, sometimes very low, um, in the range of osteoporosis, even in children, you know, during their childhood and teenage years. Um, I'm not aware of any what we call pathologic fractures where kids, you know, broke bones with very minimal trauma. But when you have a Z-score of your bone mineral density of minus five, minus eight, that certainly indicates that that bone lacks mineral and is at great risk of fracturing, you know, with relatively mild trauma. So that is something that we need to keep an eye on. I'm doing a further investigation with a group in Israel right now to better understand that, and maybe they even have a therapy, you know, that could be considered at some point. Um, but um, this is something that we need to watch, and um, I would recommend for every child that's older than five to have a DEXA scan. Um, and if it's slow, I mean, the very least that we can do is to optimize vitamin D intake, calcium intake, to get that in the normal or high normal range to provide the bone with, you know, what is needed for mineralization, even though it may not be able to rescue it all, all the way back into the normal range at this point. So that already gets me to tests I would recommend for every S, uh, SYS patient. So I think every child should have a sleep study, and um, I really want to emphasize that because it seems to me that, you know, when you think about the condition, what's the most scary thing um, is, you know, um, you want to save your child's life. And several of the kids that have passed, um, you know, uh, from the community of Schaaf yang syndrome uh, kids have passed because of apnea. They had apneic episodes. Um, so uh, every child should have a sleep study and should have that evaluated. And then, you know, that sleep specialist will work with you to find a way to handle it and to treat it, whether it's through CPAP or other things, whether it's through tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy to minimize the effect that could lead to obstruction. Um, but everybody should have a sleep study. Then I would recommend a referral to an endocrinologist, um, and I would urge them to look at least at thyroid hormones to do a glucose tolerance test and to look at growth hormone deficiency, which will start with these screening tests of IGF-1 and IGF-BP3, but may need a growth hormone stimulation test. A clinical examination for scoliosis, and if there's any concern, then x-rays for scoliosis, and for the kids five and older, a DEXA scan. Any questions about that before we get to the genetics? Okay, then let's move right on. Um, and this section is proudly presented not only by me, but also by Sean McDade, um, who has contributed uh, some of these beautiful illustrations. Um, so thank you, Sean. So, um, you know, to understand, uh, we're talking about chromosomes. And so where are the chromosomes? What do they have? So in the cells of our body, in the core of the cell, which we call the nucleus, that's where the genetic information is. And the genetic information is packed on chromosomes. So if you think of your gene genome as a library, the chromosomes would be the shelves in the library where the you know, books are stacked that contain the genetic information. And we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, so a total of 46. And this is really important um, to understand when it comes to Scharf Yang syndrome and the Majel 2 gene. So for each one of these pairs, one half, so one chromosome comes from mom and one chromosome comes from dad. So for chromosome one, we have one copy of chromosome one that comes from mom, one copy of chromosome one that comes from dad. 
for this one, you know, which is on chromosome 15, we have one chromosome 15 that comes from mom and we have one chromosome 15 that comes from dad. And this will be relevant in this context because there's something special about chromosome 15 and the area in which the Majel 2 gene is. So even though we have two copies, so you could say we have two books, you know, that contain the relevant information, only the one that comes from dad is active. So the copy that we get from mom is there, but it's like a book that has a lock on it and we can't access it. So we call this imprinting or silencing. So the information of the Majel 2 gene that comes from mom is silenced and the cell does not use it. It's like you have two instruction manuals at home on how to operate your TV but like one of those copies is glued together and you can't open it. So you only have one copy left and that's the copy that we get from dad. Now Prader-Willi syndrome is typically caused by that piece of chromosome 15 missing or not present from dad. And that could be either that the chunk of chromosome 15 is just deleted on dad's copy of the chromosome or it could mean that there's no copy of chromosome 15 that came from dad and instead the child has two copies that came from mom. In Scharf-Yang syndrome, the mechanism is different because the chromosomes are there and the material is there, but it's a point mutation. So instead of, you know, in that library with the shelf, it's not like a bunch of books are missing on the shelves, but in one of the books, which is the book of the Majel 2 gene, there's an important misspelling that kind of gives us the wrong information. So Schaff-Yang syndrome is caused by mutations in the Majel 2 gene and the Majel 2 gene is one of the genes within that Prader-Willi region on chromosome 15. Now, why is Prader-Willi syndrome testing negative in kids with Schaff-Yang syndrome? That is because the regular Prader-Willi test that you know, anyone in the NICU would order only looks at the presence of dad's information in this part of chromosome 15 and that's there so the test will come back normal or negative. What it doesn't do, it doesn't go to the level of the genetic code to spell out the genetic code and find the misspelling but that is what you would have to do to diagnose Schaff-Yang syndrome. Does that make sense? Okay. So how is Schaff-Yang syndrome diagnosed? Because it's a misspelling, so just one letter typically altered in the genetic code, we need some technology that spells out the genetic code. And that could be done in two ways. It could either be done by just sequencing the Majel 2 gene. So if you have, and hopefully in the future we'll have more and more physicians who know about Schaff-Yang syndrome, when they see a child born with low muscle tone and feeding difficulties and the contractures of the hands, they may actually say, oh, I heard about this or I learned about this and this could be Schaff-Yang syndrome, so let's just sequence the Majel 2 gene. Out of the 100 patients, there are probably five patients who had straight Majel 2 sequencing because the physician recognized the condition. And most of those are physicians in the Houston area who I've kind of hammered in, you know, <laughs> like this is what you need to be looking at. Um, most of the kids are diagnosed by whole exome sequencing. So that means that the whole genetic code is read, um, all that encodes for proteins. And this is just because there's a complicated medical condition and the physician says, well, there's something, but I don't know, let's sequence the whole thing. And then they still find the major. So they sequence the whole library and they still find the misspelling. So Emily's born with a presence of chromosome 18. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So one of the children here, Emma, uh, there was a uh, suspicion for maybe trisomy 18. And that could be, you know, in part um, because of some of the hand abnormalities. So kids with trisomy 18 tend to have those overlapping fingers. And then also the feet look kind of a special way. Um, and I, I assume that test, you know, was sent and came back negative at that time. Um, and then there's one more step actually, and that gets back to the thing with uh, mom's copy and dad's copy. So even if the mutation is found in Majel 2, that is not entirely sufficient. Um, because if you want to be really sure that it is Schaff-Yang syndrome, you would have to prove 
that the mutation is on the copy of the MAJL2 gene that came from dad. Now, in some cases, the physician may feel that that's not necessary because if they find one of these MAJL2 mutations in the context of you know, a medical condition that looks so much like Scharf-Yang syndrome, they may, they may feel very sure that that's what it is. But you know, um, Germans are very particular and um, you know, we <laughs> like try to cross every T and dot every I. So if you want to be 100% certain, you would have to prove that it's on dad's copy, okay? And um, there are some labs that do that as an automatic test. You don't have to order it. When they find the major 2 mutation, they automatically check that and they'll put it on the report. Um, there are some familial cases of scharf yang syndrome um, and that you know, also relates to the genetics. Um, so there are some families um, who, where there are like 12, 14 affected individuals in the family. And this relates to the fact that only when you get the mutation from your dad, then you can have the condition. So this could be running through a family for many generations as long as it's only passed on through the moms nobody will be affected. But when a dad who carries the mutation passes it on to his children, then it would lead to scharf yang syndrome. So you see in these families here, um, you know, all these individuals, uh, the squares are males and the circles are females. Um, all these dads carried the mutation, but we were able to show that they carried on the copy of the chromosome that they got from their mom and then only when they pass it on to their children, you know, they can have affected children. Like here, it actually went through this woman, so her children would always be unaffected, but then she had a son, and when he passed it on to his children, they were affected. So this, you know, kind of comes back to, you know, only the mutation on dad's copy will be relevant. So this is important information for many of you as you think about um, you know, how likely would we be to have another child with Scharf-Yang syndrome. There are a couple of scenarios. This is the most common scenario, and that is that it is the MAJL2 mutation is found to be a de novo mutation. So that means when they do the test, they report that the child has a MAJL2 mutation, but they also report that neither mom nor dad have the mutation. But the report may also say that the mutation was found in the child and the dad. And then it may go on to say, but in dad it was on the maternal copy. But this means that for a dad who carries the mutation, whenever this couple has children, it's a 50-50 chance. Because that dad has two copies of chromosome 15, one from mom, one from dad. In his case, the one that he got from his mom is affected. And if it's randomly chosen which one goes into the sperm. So if the one that carries the mutation goes into the sperm, then that child would have Scharf-Yang syndrome. And then we need to consider this situation, which goes back to the de novo. So there, there's at least one family that I know where the dad was found not to carry the mutation, but the family still has two affected children. Now, how is that possible? There's a very low chance of this happening, but this is called germline mosaicism. So that means the dad does not have the mutation, it's not present in his blood, but there's a subset of sperm that have the mutation. So it's a mutation that occurred at some point as the sperm were dividing and the mutation happened, and then all the sperm that originate from that one will then go on to have the mutation. So you don't detect it in his blood, but there is still an increased risk for having another child with Scharf-Yang syndrome. There's no way to test for it because you would have to take the testicle out and test like all the sperm that are in there and then you know you won't have any children anymore. <laughs> um, but you know, so even, even when in your case it was shown to be de novo, we will not say the chances of having another child with Scharf-Yang syndrome are zero. We never say zero in medicine. Um, we will say it's 2% or less because there's this 2% you know, or less remaining chance that it could be a germline mosaicism, okay? So I would always recommend, even if um, you were found not to carry the mutation, in future pregnancies, I would always recommend to consider prenatal genetic testing um, so that you would find out whether the uh, baby is affected or not. Yes, 
Yes. So, you know, when you have a child um, with uh, a major two mutation, you, in your next pregnancy, you would have to tell your prenatal genetic counselor that, you know, you have that child. Because if they do the standard testing, which is just like a screen for Down syndrome and trisomies, you know, this would not show up. But once you tell them, they will order a test specifically to look at the major two mutation. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so that's a very good question. So you are de novo and you have a child that has Sharp Yang syndrome and then you have another child that does not Sharp Yang syndrome. What are the chances for that child to have children with Sharp Yang syndrome? It's almost zero. And to this date, I'm not aware that anyone who got a mutation from his dad would be, you know, that's a, that's a mutation that causes Schafgang syndrome, that that person would not manifest the features and then pass it on to the future generation. I'm not aware of that. Like all the, all the mutations that we've studied, all the families that we've studied, there is complete penetrance. That means when you inherit one of these mutations from your dad, you have the features of Schafgang syndrome. So it would mean in, in that situation that the chances for the next generation of that unaffected child are very, very, very low, okay? But obviously, you know, that child, just by chance, could also have a mutation in the major 2 gene in his sperm and then, you know, could have affected um, uh, children. The other message, and that's kind of a general message, that um, the children of a girl will never have Sharp Yang syndrome unless something really weird happens. Um, so that means even a, a woman with Sharp Yang syndrome, should she go on to have children herself, her children will be unaffected. But when she has boys and they carry the mutation, like that boy could have affected children again. It's very complicated, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so because it's so complicated, you know, feel free to email us. Um, you can always email me and you can always email um, Megan and then um, on our website uh, of the lab, um, we also have what's called the Major 2 portal, which has a little bit of information about Shaf Yang syndrome. So with that, I'll finish. Um, I already went over time. Um, and uh, we'll go on to listen to Ryan, who will tell us about the cellular functions of Major 2. OK. <coughs> so yes, I am uh, Ryan Potts. Um, I'm a, a professor at uh, St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, it's great to be here to, to meet you all. And um, I'm gonna try to tell you a little bit about um, what my lab works on and, uh, and really try to um, give you a little bit of a understanding of what the molecular functions of this major 2 gene is. And um, I'm going to go ahead and apologize. I'm not, I don't typically talk to uh, more lay audiences. So I'm, um, if you don't understand something as I'm talking, you feel free to, to speak up because I will try my best to, to make, um, make it understandable. So the, my goals are, are of this is basically uh, four, fourfold. The first two here are basically outlining what is this major two uh, gene and protein. And what does it do in a molecular sense in the cell? And then I'll go on to tell you about um, how it regulates certain cellular processes uh, on ongoing. And then finally, um, give you some insights to uh, how our research has uh, come up with um, potential therapeutic strategies in the long run. So we'll start with these first two. So what is this major two protein and, and what is its uh, molecular functions? So this major 2 protein is part of a large family of proteins, which all are called mage proteins. And uh, on the left over here, you can see a, a diagram that there's many of these different proteins um, that fall into different um, subfamilies, the mage A, mage B, mage C, et cetera. And, with, and those are typically referred to as type 1 mages. Then you have these down here in the pink are called type 2 mages. And major 2 is one of these type 2 mages. And so what I've done here is blown up on the right, specifically all the human maze genes. And so there's about 40 different human maze genes. And major 2 
again, is in this pink side over here, uh, right there. And so obviously that's the gene we're talking about here today. So all the proteins in this, in this protein family have a common um, type of architecture. Um, they have a common type of uh, sequence similarities, and they fold into a particular structure um, that all have this common um, domain, which is something we call a, a protein that has a similar type of sequence in, and fold. And that domain is called the mage homology domain. And that's sort of an important part of the protein that, uh, that we study. And um, this is just showing you again um, so where some of those mutations are um, that Christian already outlined in more detail, but they all fall sort of prior to the start of this really important domain down here, this mage homology domain. And as a result, most of the times these mutations lead to deletion of this really important part of the protein. So um, that's, that's the general basics of what, this, uh, g what protein this gene encodes. So now to tell you about um, what it does in, the, in a more molecular sense, um, I have to introduce a new uh, area here to you called um, uh, ubiquitin. So ubiquitin is a, a small protein um, that is attached to other proteins. It's like a, um, it's like a stamp. Um, when well you have a letter and you want it to go somewhere, you've got to add this stamp. And then the stamp can tell the sort of where to, where to send it to. And so ubiquitin is like that. It's a small protein that gets attached to other proteins, and it tells what, ha what should happen to that protein. Okay? And so there's, a, there's a, uh, really intricate mechanisms that regulate this attachment of that stamp to other proteins, this ubiquitin protein. How that thing gets on to other proteins is highly regulated in the cell through a three enzyme process involving these E1, E2, and E3 enzymes. And so uh, I won't go over the details of how, how this happens, but just to say that you start with this free ubiquitin over here, and eventually it needs to get attached to this red guy over here, and there's all these different enzymes that do that. And this is like a really important process in the cell, and, and there's Nobel Prize was awarded to uh, these three gentlemen um, back in 2004 for the discovery of these enzymes. And so why am I telling you about this? I'm telling you this about this because MAJO2 is one of these proteins right there. This last step in this cascade that, that results in the attachment of that small little stamp protein to this other protein, it can be controlled by this MAJO2 protein. We refer to this as like an E3 uh, ubiquitin ligase. And specifically, my lab has discovered that MAJO2 uh, will form into these E3 ubiquitin ligase complexes along with other proteins. Uh, here are two that I'm showing you here. And so we try to now understand um, what does MAJO2 in, in conjunction with these other proteins do in the cell given that it functions in this regulation of attaching these little um, uh, ubiquitin proteins onto other proteins. So that's, uh, that's the sort of basics of um, what I think it do, uh, this protein is doing at the molecular function. So what about how that I impacts a cell? So um, what we've discovered is that MAJO2 regulates the trafficking of other proteins in the cell. So you know the cell here is composed of different parts, like Christian talked about the nucleus where the gen genetic material is, where there's other parts of the cell where different proteins are. And proteins don't just sit around in the same place, they'll move around all in the cell. And that's what all these arrows are, showing you that the proteins are moving around. And what we've found is that MAJO2, um, in, in conjunction in this complex with these other proteins and, and functioning and regulating this ubiquitin pathway, is that um, it will control um, um, the movement of proteins in the cell. So how does it do that? So uh, just to go in uh, and uh, zoom in on this, process here a little bit. What we found is that in, in, the, in the normal context, what MAJO2 does is it helps uh, recycle proteins. Um, so these proteins here, these guys out here, these blue ones, um, they are typically on the cell surface. But sometimes they come in into little structures called endosomes. And uh, what we found is that MAJO2 will help them get back out to the cell surface where they need to be. However, if you lose MAJO2, um, in this context over here, instead of them getting traffic back out to the cell surface where they should be, 
they now get sent to the garbage can. And as a result, the cell no longer has the full complement of these little blue guys out here as you normally do in this case. What about proteins? That's exactly right. These are proteins that are typically on the surface of the cell. They come into the cell, they do something, and then they need to be sent back out there to keep continue doing their job. However, when you lose this major two, they can't go back out. They get stuck here, and as a result, they eventually go into a degradation me mechanism um, in a cell called the lysosome. And this is sort of the, the cell's trash can that chews up the stuff. So um, how does it do that? How does the major two actually help this error to make it go back out? So we can zoom in a little further into this process to give you a little more detail of how we think it works. So uh, MAJO2, which is part of this complex that uh, we refer to as the MUS complex because it uh, has two other proteins with it, it functions on these endosomes to promote the recycling of these proteins. It, now these proteins are sort of like these purple guys, and they need to go back out of this endosome. And the way it does that is it regulates another protein called the WASH protein. And what the WASH protein does is it lays down this uh, a, a filament of actin on the endosome which is the cytoskeletal component that helps organize this structure. And so the, the key molecular event here is that, the, that this mage protein regulates the, this WASH complex, okay? And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Is yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah, so that, that's actually, so I, the colors are not uh, coordinated as well as they should be. This is actually the pink guy, okay? <laughs> Uh, so this is, uh, this is what we refer to as endosome. This is a vesicle within the cell um, where proteins come into and are sort of sorted. So they can be sorted back out to the surface or they can be sorted to the trash can. And um, so what, what I'm showing you here is, uh, again, this should be pink. And uh, these are those little proteins that are, they would have been the blue guys out there on the other slide. And uh, this is the mage L2 and then the mage L2 um, promotes recycling of these proteins back to the membrane through regulating this WASH protein, okay? So what is that? So um, this is very complicated and I, I won't go over the details at all, but so, so just to tell you that essentially what happens is that WASH protein, which is this yellow guy here, um, is typically inhibited and it needs to be activated. And what the MAGE-02 does is it adds that ubiquitin stamp uh, which is this little white balls here with a U, um, onto the wash protein to activate it. So it goes from an inactive to an active form. And so just a more cartoon drawing of that is basically you've got this wash protein, this is a washing machine, it's sort of inactive, and you gotta make, you got to turn it on, right? And well, if you've ever been to like these laundromats, you got to put in the quarter, right? And so the quarter here is really this ubiquitin. So the, the MAJO2 is activating this wash complex um, by sticking on this ubiquitin onto them, okay? So that's, that's really boiling it down to the, the nitty-gritty details of how we think that this maize protein um, works in the cell through ubiquination of this wash protein that turns it on, and that allows the movement of these proteins back to the cell surface, preventing their um, uh, degradation in the trash can, okay? So... Um, I think uh, I will skip this part because I guess uh, Rachel may tell you a little bit about that. And I'll move to how we think this, um, this understanding of the molecular function could give way to um, how we could uh, come up with therapeutic strategies. Um, and so I think there's, there's a several different ways you can imagine of coming up with therapeutic strategies. Um, so so, uh, and the one, only one I'm going to really talk about in detail is based on uh, our understanding of how MAJO2 regulates that WASH complex. Could we come up with some kind of drug to, to um, circumvent that problem when you get rid of MAJO2? And so, um, so as I mentioned, you, you need to have this, uh, you need to activate this WASH complex. And the way we think MAJO2 does that is it adds those little ubiquitin guys on here, okay? So in the MAJO2 lo loss of function, when you have Shafe Yang and you don't have MAJO2, could you somehow um, mimic this addition of these ubiquitins? 
right? Because that's the main problem here. We don't have these ubiquitins anymore. So it's, it's, um, it's sort of like, um, how can we come up with a way for the cell to think that there's a ubiquitin there, but there's not, right? Because there's, no there's no ubiquitin. So the idea is basically to come up with some type of therapeutic, some kind of compound or something that could get in here and mimic what the ubiquitin does without actually putting on the ubiquitin because you don't have the mage L2, you don't get the ubiquitin. And so that's basically what, what my lab is, is, is striving to do is to try to find such compounds that would get in here and, and activate this thing even when you don't have mage L2. And as a result, um, the, 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 the idea is that when you do have this defected, defective trafficking as we've talked about, um, if you could add in such a therapy, you can now start to get these blue guys going back to the surface, and now you could get maybe some rescue in the function at the very um, cellular level that would then um, help, hopefully, with some of the, the problems. And so I'll stop there and uh, answer any other questions you have. Um, I, know, I know it was a fairly quick and detailed, but I'll, um, and you can definitely go um, to our website uh, I don't have an email listed here, but it's definitely on my, <coughs> uh, my website, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Yeah. So do you know what that cellular function actually your body believes? Yeah, so that's a good question. The question is basically, uh, I told you all about this cellular function, this trafficking of these proteins, right? And so how does that actually impact um, the body, and thus how does loss of major 2 um, at this level in, uh, result in these uh, symptoms that you see in your children. So that's, a, that's a definitely a big area that we're trying to figure out. And I think that really boils down to what are these blue proteins, right? Because if, if we know what those blue proteins are and we know what they do in the cell, then we could understand maybe why there are these defects. And so we're starting to get a handle on what those proteins are and, and I maybe, um, maybe Rachel will also talk about that. So um, I hope so. So I, I won't. Uh, is that a growth protein? That's the only defect that happens with the major two. I mean, uh, it's always very hard to to um, to say that that's the only thing that happens. Um, that's that's certainly one of the prominent um, functions of this protein that we know of. Um, there may be other things that we haven't discovered yet, but um, from my perspective, this is a very important one. And so um, this is the one, this is one, one uh, function of this protein that we're really trying to understand better and potentially uh, therapeutically target. So do we have mouse models of this or we have that protein? Yes, and uh, I think Rachel will um, tell you all about those, those mice probably. Yeah. So then how do you think you know who this protein Yes, uh-huh, yeah. Yep, yeah. yep, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, I, sh I confused you there probably. Um, but I think I can set you straight. Uh, so we'll just go back here to, um, to this slide where I, f I showed where the mutations are um, on the protein. So down here, right? And so these are the, where the mutations are, where the truncations occur, yeah? Well, all these truncations occur prior to this, this important domain that I mentioned, this, this purple region, right? Well, this purple region is the part of the protein that actually is necessary for that ubiquination event on the wash and the trafficking of the proteins. So even though you may have, even in some cases, 75% of the protein there, the really important part has been cut off. Does that help? Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'll turn it over to Rachel now. Thank you, Ryan. Um, and as I pull up uh, Rachel's presentation, there are two more things that I wanted to tell you. Uh, one is, you know, it's called Scharf Yang syndrome. So Dr. Yang, you know, who is Dr. Yang and where is she, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Dr. Yaping Yang is the director of the whole exome sequencing laboratory at Baylor College of Medicine. So after I identified the first patient, Dani, who I told you about, I went to Dr. Yang to ask, are there any other patients out there that you have in your database who have mutations in MAJL2? So she helped me find those. She's a PhD molecular geneticist. And Dr. Yang really wanted to be here with us today. She'd registered, she'd booked her flight. But you know of the hurricane that's hitting the Gulf Coast, including Houston. 
And I hope that I'll be able to make it back to Houston to my family and you know my kids and my wife tomorrow. Um, but Dr. Yang was in the same exact situation. And because of a family medical situation, she could not risk being stuck here in Indianapolis, but she knew that she would definitely need to be back in Houston by Sunday night. And because she didn't want to take that risk, um, she couldn't come and she apologizes, but she hopes that she'll get a chance to meet all of you and get to know you hopefully next year, okay? And then the other thing I wanted to say is I said that you know, you have the uh, people, like some of the most important people who know about Majel II in the room today. But as I was sitting here, I just thought, you know, that's probably true for this side of the Atlantic Ocean, um, but there's also another side of the Atlantic Ocean. So I should mention, if you want to read more about Majel II, there's some wonderful work that has been done and continues to be done in Europe um, by uh, groups in France. And one of the names there is Francoise Muscatelli and her group and I, connect, I can connect you to them and kind of you know, uh, show you some of their work. Um, but we work together, we talk to one another, and it's our common goal to kind of you know, uh, provide better insight into Majel II. Um, so I, I was a little kind of US-centric as I was making that statement. Thanks, it's great to be here today and to meet all of you. Um, I wanted to just follow up on that comment as well, and as I was listening to uh, the summary of all of the features of Shaf-Yang syndrome, so many of them are like prader willi syndrome, and so there's that whole other conference that's going on across the hall and, and later today and tomorrow morning, and um, both from the perspective of parents of children with special needs and the perspective of those specific needs themselves, there's a ton of information that you can get from, from the uh, people who are giving the talks here and from the families that are going through many of those same struggles and, and same challenges that you're going through. I've, I've been going to prader willi syndrome conferences for uh, 20 years and so have seen a lot of those kids grow up and seen a lot of the families with um, children with, with prader willi syndrome go through all sorts of, uh, you know, all sorts of, of challenges and all sorts of uh, highlights in their children's lives too. So definitely, definitely encourage you to, to spend time with, with those families because there are lots of great people who can give lots of great advice about a lot of the same sorts of, um, uh, same sorts of issues that you're looking at. Um, so this is like Reddit, ask me anything <laughs> as I go along to definitely feel free to, to stop me um, and, and if you have any questions. Um, so I'm gonna focus more on uh, mouse models of MAGEL2 deficiency and I know that uh, some people have difficulty with the concept that we use animals in research um, and my um, own feeling is that if we can use animals to make people's lives better, then that's what we're going to do. Um, there's a lot of uh, animal, very, very good animal work going on in the world, looking at a whole variety of genetic and non-genetic disorders, and a lot of progress would not have been made without the use of animals. Um, if there's anybody who's uncomfortable with the use of animals in research, then that's what I'm going to be talking about. Um, I will say that our animals are treated extremely well. We have a mouse facility in the basement and they're in clean cages and they're given food and water and we don't do anything that makes them suffer. So just, I'll, I'll just put that out there to, to start with. Um, so we've talked about um, Shaf-Yang syndrome and about this intersection between endocrine dysfunction, behavior, um, the hypotonia with contractures, uh, the, that constellation of intellectual disability and autism spectrum disorder. Um, and our challenge, of course, is to figure out how all of these different pieces of the puzzle fit together. Um, when you think about some other genetic disorders where children might have a muscular dystrophy or they might have a lung disease, it, it's, it's much simpler to say, well, if 
they have problems only with their muscles, then we're looking for a protein that's important in muscle function, and so we should really, really just focus on muscle. But as you can see, um, we know that there are uh, dysfunctions in many, many different systems. And so it really is a puzzle um, trying to figure out how the loss of one protein can cause that whole constellation of symptoms. And you can imagine the challenge in Prader-Willi syndrome where um, a whole series of genes are missing. And so then some genes do some things and other genes do other things. And so that's why Prader-Willi syndrome has been so challenging. In a sense, Schaff-Yang syndrome should be a little bit simpler because we know exactly what the gene is. We don't know exactly what it does, but we know which gene it is that we're looking at. In Prader-Willi syndrome, it's, it's uh, actually a level of complexity up from that. So we've already talked about the symptoms of Schaff-Yang syndrome changing through um, life uh, with hypotonia starting prenatally and uh, developmental delay, endocrine dysfunction, and then a uh, constellation of other um, symptoms arising through life, but really in a very continuous way. So uh, may I make one statement? Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Um, <laughs> but I think there's an important message that I did not give you, and I want to give to all of the families, especially the newly diagnosed families, as you think about how this progresses over life, there's one important fact that I, th I think we've seen, you know, uh, throughout, uh, you know, this cohort of patients, and that is, it seems that the condition is most complicated and most difficult to handle, requires the highest level of medical attention in the early years of infancy and childhood. And it's not only a condition that doesn't get worse over time, I actually think that medically it becomes easier to manage as the kids get older. There may be some new things that come up, um, but generally, you know, all the challenges and the long kind of, you know, time that you spend in the NICU, sometimes in the ICU, you know, that's something that clearly clusters in these first years of life. And uh, some, you know, that's where it's really worth talking to the families who have kids in their teenage or adult years. And I think most of them will attest to that. Sorry. Uh, all right, so we talked uh, about the MAGEL2 gene and how it's located on chromosome 15. Um, and so I mentioned that in Prader-Willi syndrome, the, um, those individuals are missing this entire cluster of genes that all do different things inside the cell. And here um, is the MAGEL2 gene, and that's the one that is affected in Schaff-Yang syndrome. And so um, we're going to be concentrating on just that today. So we identified the MAGEL2 gene in, published that in 2000. So that was long before there was the identification of any individuals, any children, who had mutations in this gene. So we've known about the gene and the protein for much, much longer than we've known about um, Schaff-Yang syndrome. Um, so we talked about this as well just briefly, but just to say that there are many genes um, that are encoded within this DNA. Uh, those genes, about 20,000 different genes. Um, of those, there are in the thousands in which mutations cause various disorders. So childhood onset disorders, adult onset disorders, many genes that are important in cancer. So there are, um, uh, all sorts of things that can go wrong with DNA and with genes and that can contribute to, they, also, they not only contribute to disease, but they also make us who we are as individuals. So there are genes that make our hair blonde or that make our hair dark or that make us tall or short or um, pretty much any variation that you see in, in human or animal populations is as a result of differences in those genes. Only when those differences are um, sort of large in magnitude, it, that's when you start to see a, what you would call a dysfunction or, or a problem that happens. So the genes are transcribed into RNAs. Those RNAs encode proteins, and the proteins are really the, these um, working molecules within the cell. And the, those proteins are important in cells throughout the body. 
Some proteins are important only in certain organs. So there are proteins that are only important in the liver or only in the kidney. And there are other proteins that are important throughout the body. And that, um, that point is, um, is critical because it can explain in part why some systems are affected and not others. So we don't see uh, problems, for example, usually in the heart in children with Chafyang syndrome, but um, that may be because the protein, the MHL2 protein may not be as important in the heart as it is in the brain or in the endocrine system. Uh, so our approaches have been to look at gene discovery and protein function. So we want to know not just what happens when MHL2 is missing or mutated, but what does it normally do? And so that's, what, that's the point that Ryan was getting to. Um, then to follow up on that, what happens when it's missing? How does the lack of this protein cause uh, this dysfunction? Animal models. Can animals be used as preclinical models for MHL2 deficiency? And this is a big theme in medical research, is that before you want to try any new therapies on humans, you want to try them first in animals, and even before that, you want to try them in cells, and even before that, you want to know that that therapy is actually working in the, the biochemical or um, cell biological system that you're interested in treating. So uh, the preclinical models are the, are the step that are immediately before a clinical trial of a drug. And they're used throughout medical research, that, that drugs are tested first in animals um, to make sure that they are not very toxic, to make sure that they actually work in the way that they're thought to work, and to make sure that um, they can then be translated effectively into therapies that might work in people. And so that's not specific to this disorder, that's just generally in medical research, that's, that's the flow that drugs go through, that they go through cell trials and then animal models. Uh, and so our question was, can we have an, a model for this disorder uh, that can then be used in this preclinical testing? And then can we design therapeutics that are more specific that can compensate for the loss of MHL2? And so the first question you might have is, well, there's this other perfectly good copy sitting right there, and you've just told me that it's silent. Why don't we just turn that one on? Because then we could just replace the gene, replace the protein, and we're good to go. And of course, I wish it were that, that simple, but there are people who are working on, on that um, in the, pro the whole Prader-Willi syndrome region, trying to just turn on that maternal copy that's silent, and it's not just silent in people who have a deletion on the other chromosome, it's silent in everybody. So all people have a silent maternal chromosome 15 region and that active one that came from the father. Um, and so then if the active one is missing, then conceptually you could say, well, we'll just turn on the maternal one. And there are people who are working on that for the whole Prader-Willi syndrome region and as well just for individual genes. Uh, but can we, the other way to look at it is instead of doing it at a genetic level, can we design therapies that substitute for the function of that missing protein? So the lab mouse as a preclinical model, the systems that we are most interested in looking at are uh, the brain and the muscle, and that's because um, the, the majority of the symptoms are, affect those two systems. They affect, they affect um, the brain, and um, specifically this little region of the brain that's right here. So this is the brain of a mouse, and it's kind of lying on its side. So that's the front of the brain, and this is the back. That's called the cerebellum, that twisted structure, and then the spinal cord would come down here. And that little region that I've highlighted in yellow is called the hypothalamus and that's the region of the brain that controls what's called homeostasis. So that means how the body regulates itself from minute to minute, hour to hour, day to day, week to week, and year to year without you having to consciously think about it. So most people can maintain their body weight for years without having to actively 
take in a certain number of calories and expend a certain amount of energy. They sleep for eight hours and then they're up for 14 hours without having to think about it. So um, fluid balance is also regulated there, sleep uh, that, uh, um, and as well the regulation of hormones is controlled by this little structure in yellow called the hypothalamus. So we don't have to think about when we secrete growth hormone or reproductive hormones or any of um, uh, those sorts of day-to-day -day functions. And that is very clearly dysregulated in Prader-Willi syndrome and it, I would say, is pretty clearly dysregulated as well in shaf yang syndrome. So that, that little region of the brain is very important. And then muscle, of course, um, because of the hypotonia or the, or the um, poor muscle control in both Prader-Willi syndrome and shaf yang syndrome. So the, the advantages of using these preclinical or animal models, we can manipulate the mouse genome. And so we can uh, now look at the genes in the mouse and decide that we want to take out an entire gene or remove a part of a gene or even change one single base to another base pair, just like what happens in a point mutation in a genetic disorder. And so you may have heard about CRISPR technology, that's a newer technology, um, but we've had that ability to manipulate the mouse genome in that way and take out genes or put in genes uh, for uh, 30 years now. And so we can manipulate the mouse genome to produce specific mutations. We can test therapies, I mentioned that before using them in humans. We can analyze tissues that are inaccessible in humans so that we can look at the mouse brain. Um, we can look at, at um, mice before they're born uh, to, see what, to see what's going on. And we can also test therapies in those animal models. So we can try um, therapies throughout life at different ages. So we have had uh, mouse uh, knockout, MAGEL2, what are called knockout mice, so that's where the gene is missing. Um, engineered to lack MAGEL2, and we published that in 2007, so 10 years ago was when we first made these mice. We've been looking at them for 10 years. Um, and they have a mutation in the part of the DNA that encodes this MAGEL2 gene. This is the human set of genes going along here with the MAGEL2 gene here, but in the mouse they have pretty much the same lineup of genes as us, even though mice and other mammals are very different from humans, they're actually very similar in other ways. So all animals have the same sorts of organs and they have the same sorts of day-night rhythm. They have tails, we don't. They're furry all over, we're not. But otherwise, um, we're, we're all animals and we share a lot of our genetic material is fairly similar. And so when we knock out the MAGEL2 gene, that gene is pretty similar between, between mice and humans, and so there's that parallel, yes? So I read your article about the chicken genome, mm -hmm. and, the mm -hmm. and so my question, when you created these mice with your MAGEL2 gene, did they also have muscle, the muscle had any issues with that besides the circadian rhythm that they were affected? Uh, right, so the question was about the, um, whether we have looked at, at muscle in the mice that lack MAGEL2, and I'll, I will touch on that, but um, I, I'll say that we've, when we've been studying the mice, we've really kept in mind uh, what the symptoms are of Prader-Willi syndrome and asked the question, do the mice share those symptoms? And the reason I say Prader-Willi syndrome is because that's what existed <laughs> when, we were, when we were first studying these, and so we were, we were looking for symptoms in the mice that are similar to symptoms that they see in Prader-Willi syndrome, and muscle weakness is a major, major symptom, uh, particularly in infants with Prader-Willi syndrome, but throughout life as well. So I will get to that, yeah. Um, so, oh, our question, here we go. Um, do mice missing the MAGEL2 gene have symptoms of, and I've put shaf yang syndrome, but Prader-Willi syndrome as well. Why does loss of MAGEL2 cause muscle weakness and uh, can we test treatments in mice missing MAGEL2? So this is a summary of, of a lot of work that's gone on uh, in my laboratory, in Francoise Muscatelli's laboratory, um, and uh, sort of as a, as a 
combination um, of, well, a, a series of experiments that have been carried out by a whole series of graduate students and postdoctoral fellows and technicians in my lab. And so just if there's only going to be one slide, <laughs> then, then this would be it that, that covers much of what we've learned is that the mice have impaired learning, particularly in novel environments. So if they're in a new environment, they have that impaired um, learning. And then um, I guess you're not going to talk about the behavior study. So, so Dr. Schaff's lab has also done uh, studies of behavior in social situations. So what happens when a mouse is put in uh, a cage where there's a mouse that they've never met before? or um, so th those uh, intermouse relationships. Um, the, the studies that we did were just one mouse at a time about learning and memory. Um, they do have reduced uh, muscle mass. They have increased fat mass. They have uh, reduced bone density, we mentioned before. They have reduced strength and reduced endurance. So they definitely have these characteristics of hypotonia or of muscle weakness. Um, they have uh, endocrine dysfunction, infertility, um, growth hormone deficiency, um, hypoglycemia, actually, and, and not just low blood sugar, but particularly low blood sugar in response to situations where their blood sugar is dropping low anyway. Most of the time, people have a response that allows them to raise their own blood sugar if they're um, getting low in blood sugar. So if you've gone a long time without eating, then there are hormones that are released that allow the sugar that you already have in your body to, um, uh, to be used by the other organs. And in these mice, that, that so-called counter-regulatory response um, is poor. Uh, adrenal as well, and I don't know if you recommend as well adrenal testing as part of the endocrine Work up it. That is something that's found in in Prader Willi syndrome. One of the recommendations. I There's don't at know. least one patient who I'm aware who had adrenal insufficiency. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, so yes. So when a child gets sick, they can get very very sick because their adrenal <laughs> glands don't properly respond to the stress of the infection, um, surgery. As well, I mean, you should explain this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really the response to stress, and so when well, adrenal well, insufficiency yeah. is about regulating electrolytes in your blood and maintaining blood pressure, so blood pressure can drop like very quickly. Um, this is something that, again, you know, I recommend it to uh, be seen by a pedi pediatric endocrinologist. This is something that they may consider in their workup, depending on the history that you provide. It's something that's not all that easy to test because you may have to go through certain stress tests to trigger that system. So in the absence of a history and me not being aware that this is a common feature across the patient population, we may be hesitant to put this in to these situations. Um, and then we, uh, I'll touch on the uh, circadian rhythm um, as well as the sleep-wake cycles. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about the learning deficits. Um, so the mouse, mice that are lacking MAGEL2 are underweight and then they gain excess weight as adults. So along the y-axis here is the uh, weight of the mouse. So a mouse will get up to about 30 grams or so by the time they uh, reach maturity. Um, along here are the age in weeks. And so a mouse is weaned at about four weeks of age. So they go from, from zero to four weeks with their mothers and then around three to four weeks they're weaned from their mothers and then they're considered adults by the time they are eight, 10, 12 weeks of age, and a mouse will live um, for a year or a year and a half, a just like hamsters and gerbils and other rodents. So that's about the age that they reach. But one of the things that we noticed that was, was that before weaning, they're actually underweight. 
And then as they go through life, when they just become young adults here, they become overweight compared to the um, litter mates, so the, the other mice that don't have the mage L2 deficiency. This is not a big difference in a mouse. So there are obese mice that can get up to 50 and 60 grams. So this is not really an, an, a very obese mouse. But what we know is that even though their weight is not very different, they actually carry a lot more fat mass than <coughs> the control mice. So this is actually an x-ray of two mice that weigh the same. And this is the mouse that's missing mage L2, and this is the mouse that is wild type, we call them, or control for mage L2. You can see all the fat that's accumulating here in the belly of the mouse. And that mouse actually has quite a bit more fat and has less lean mass or less muscle mass. So these um, mice can be not very overweight, but can be quite over fat, as it were. Uh, I mentioned the hypothalamus, which regulates this homeostatic function, homeostasis. And it, um, the, the function of the hypothalamus is to sense all of the hormones that are in the bloodstream and then also get um, input from the nervous system through the spinal cord and to sense what's going on in the rest of the body. And then it sends this output to the rest of the brain to decide what to do. And that's without, it's a very ancient structure. It's without conscious thought. So animals have this so that they can spend their time thinking about important things and having all of that regular day-to-day, hour-to-hour um, done automatically. And it's involved in appetite and energy expenditure. It's involved in this circadian rhythm, which is um, what allows us to have a, a, a day-night rhythm. That's called the circadian rhythm or the rhythm of the day. Sleep and wake cycles, which are connected to circadian rhythm. And the hypothalamus is also in charge of this release of reproductive and, and growth hormones. And that's because the hypothalamus of the brain is connected through a stalk to the pituitary gland. That sits at the base of the brain, and it's the pituitary gland that actually makes all of those hormones, reproductive hormones and growth hormones and, and many other um, many other hormones. So that, um, that combination of hypothalamus and pituitary is what controls uh, hormone release. Um, we know that mage L2 is uh, most active in this little part of the brain. And so this is now a brain um, that's been cut um, of, of a mouse that's been cut through the, through the middle and the base of the brain right here, where that dark, dark purple spot is, that's where the mage L2 gene is most active. So I mentioned before that some genes are more active in some organs than in others. This gene is very, very active in the hypothalamus and actually the, the pituitary's been cut off here, but it would sit right under, right under the base of the brain there. And we know that there are um, neurons in the uh, hypothalamus whose main job is to sense this hormone leptin, which is produced by fat cells, and that leptin signals to the brain, and then the brain says whether it needs to um, have more energy taken in or use up more energy. And this is very relevant in Prader-Willi syndrome because those children have severe uh, loss of appetite control. And so we were mainly looking at this role of this mage L2 gene in appetite control because that, that excessive eating is a major, major feature of Prader-Willi syndrome. It uh, doesn't seem to be as much of a problem in mage L2 deficiency alone. And so in that way, Prader-Willi syndrome may be more complex than, uh, than we know right now. I mentioned that um, the mice are just that slightly overweight uh, and over fat, but the, one of the main features is that they're far, far less active. And so if you put a wheel in a cage with a mouse, then mice like to run on wheels. And you can count how many revolutions they make in a 24-hour period, given free access to a running wheel. Anybody who's had a hamster would remember that they, they just they just run, run and run and run and run. 
So a, a mouse will run 12,000 times around that wheel in 24 hours, but the mice that are missing MAGEL2 won't voluntarily run nearly that much. So that, that reduction in activity is probably the main reason for the, for the gain in excess gain in weight and excess gain in fat. And not just do they run less, they don't have the day-night rhythm that, uh, that a regular mouse will have. So a control mouse, uh, they're nocturnal. So mice are awake at in the dark and they sleep in the light, they're backwards from us. And so if you look just at the amount of activity, they run in these little bursts. And so the mouse will run and then rest a little bit and then run and it'll do this throughout the entire dark or active period. And during the light period, um, they'll have a long stage where they sleep. And so that's the sleeping part and that's the awake part and the, this um, reflects the amount of activity that these mice have. And you can see that the mice that are lacking MAGEL2, not only do they run a lot less, but their activity is distributed much more throughout both parts of the day and the night. If the lights are completely out all the time, then they will run or not run um, throughout that entire 24-hour cycle. A regular mouse, a normal mouse, will still sleep in an eight-hour block. And so that's one, um, one clue that we have to the, to the function because in the absence of that, that light input, um, they don't know whether it's day or night, these mice. And that may also be true in people who are missing this MAGEL2 gene, is that the, they really, really need those light signals in order to have a proper sleep-wake cycle if the lights are, are on all the time or it's dark all the time, which presumably you don't do because you don't put your kids in the dark all the time. But um, sometimes you might have a, a light on in the bedroom or, or down the hall or something. And so then there's that question of whether that um, may, in the because of the nature of this gene, that may actually be more disruptive to them than it would be to somebody who is more able to just have a long sleep block, um, even if it, there's a bit of light. I have to finish. Okay. Um, we use a lot of different tests to test muscle tone. Um, so uh, grip strength is one of them where uh, you can put the mouse on this little grid and pull gently on their tail and then there it measures the grip strength and so we see that there's grip strength is lower and we've also done treadmill tests with these mice. So what are possible interventions? Of course there's uh, symptomatic interventions, physical therapy, uh, hormones, growth hormone, I mentioned light dark cycles. And then um, what we're interested in is this side, which is MAGEL2 directed, so gene activation or functional replacement. And we can use all of these outcomes that we've developed over the years, all of these symptoms in the mice, to uh, determine whether any of the interventions that we make are making any difference. So I've talked about percent fat mass, grip strength, treadmill, wheel running, behavior tests, and biochemical measures, and we can use all of those to test whether our interventions are useful. So there are some um, therapeutic testing. There's some therapeutic testing that's already been done in mice lacking MAGEL2. Um, so uh, there's a compound, this is a cannabinoid-like compound that has been tested in a mouse model of carter willi syndrome, and that was our MAGEL2 mice, and they were looking at food intake. This is also a cannabinoid-like um, compound that was uh, tested for, um, in principle, for treating obesity and carter willi syndrome, but it was in mice lacking MAGEL2. We did a study with a compound called setmelanotide, uh, which acts in the hypothalamus, looking at energy expenditure, um, and this is our um, collaborator, Darlene Sandoval, who uh, did gastric bypass surgery on mice, which <laughs> I, I don't know how you do that because they're, they're little, right? But, <laughs> yeah. So um, like a sleeve gastrectomy where they cut off part of the stomach and then mice lost weight. So there you go. Um, but that was specifically in the MAGEL2 null mice as a proof of principle for Prader-Willi syndrome. So um, 
I've given you kind of a timeline of, of our thought process for what we've, what we've done in the last um, 17 years. So we found the gene in 2000. I talked about the, the uh, knockout mouse, looking at the different deficits. Um, it wasn't until 2013 that the mutations were identified as a cause of Shaft-Yang syndrome. Um, a little bit, those preclinical trials that I showed you were, have all been done in the last two years. So it's, it's pretty brand new for, for that. Um, and upcoming clinical studies and trials and then the next steps, of course, are up to all of you to decide, you know, how you want to have your input into what the next steps are in research. Because I'm, I'm telling you about the research that I've done, but all of this research has to get funded by, by granting agencies. And one of my um, go-to agencies, of course, is the Foundation for prader willi Research, who's funded a lot of my work. And uh, I've had input from them as to where their priorities are. And as researchers, we not only do things to find, like, because we're curious about how things work, but we also do research that's relevant to the people who are going to then be using that research um, to make their own lives better. So in part, it's up to you to say what your priorities are for how you, how you want that research to go. So you're not just sitting back and, and watching the research as it's being done, but you have an opportunity to, to contribute. And Christian keeps giving me looks <laughs> like I <I'm> move along. <laughs> anyway, um, so I'd like to acknowledge um, the Foundation for Prader Willi Research, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. If you haven't guessed, by the way, I say mouse. I'm from Canada, University of Alberta. Um, and uh, all the people in uh, the, my lab over the years who've done all of this work. So thank you. I'll take any other questions. Uh, so what was the, so uh, symptomatic treatment and what was the second thing that you said? As opposed to a, a wholesale replacement substitute for medicine. Right. So, I mean, symptomatic treatment is always great because if you can identify um, a therapeutic that will work quickly and safely and make everybody's life better, then of course that's that's what you want to do first. So um, the other types of treatments that are more experimental may eventually be a better way to go, but in the meantime, they all have to be tested to make sure that they're safe, they're efficacious, and that they are the right way to go. That's kind of a general answer, but we can talk about it more afterwards, sure. <laughs> 